Welcome back, or hello, I'm Taylor and this is part two of what is going to be a six part series diving into the classic Super Famicom game, Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War. If you haven't caught part one, you'll want to give it a watch as we'll be jumping right in there where we left off. Or not, I'm not your father, do, 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 do whatever. Regardless, spoilers ahead, thanks for choosing to watch this, enjoy. We open up to Sigurd, receiving instructions from the royal court in Valhalla to preside over Verdain at Evan's castle. He and Diodora marry. Despite most of Granbell's forces still fighting with Isaac, the small contingency conquering Verdain has put Augustria up north in an uproar. And rightfully so. King of Augustria, Imica, uh, he had tried to have healthy ties with Granbell has died. His son, Chagall, takes over, eyeing invasion to show his people that they will not kowtow to Granville's recent aggressions. We are then shown Elchon aiming to talk to his new king. His sister, Lachesis, is fearful of her brother's approach as she believes the rumors floating about that Chagall he killed his father for the throne. But Elchon refuses to consider the rumors without any proof. He leaves for Augusti Castle. Upon arriving, he asks the new king to reconsider his attack on Granville's forces as his father had been a great ally to them. Chagall, not in any mood to suffer, slights, real or imagined, presently or from the past, has Elchon thrown in prison. Then, the new king sends orders to Boldo to attack Nodian and onward to Granville. Archbishop Manfroy appears as well to egg on Chagall, which <laughs> that, that, that really can't be good. Lachesis is informed about her brother's predicament and braces for attack from Boldo's son, Elliot, who was embarrassed by Elchon the previous chapter. Oife informs Sigurd about what is transpiring. He rushes to ready himself to save Lachesis. Diodora begs her husband to not leave her, but he insists on heading out. She joins him in battle as she's worried that if they were to part, they'd never see each other again. No, that's just silly. People in love say the silliest things. Chapter 2 starts much like Chapter 1, giving us a clear goal at the start, save the cases, as well as bringing Herheim Castle, where Elliot's father Boldo rules, to heal. Time is of the essence, and while it was always an element in previous chapters, and very much in the series as a whole, here it becomes a bigger deal. Lachesis' life is on the line. Also, if her three protectors survive, you receive a night ring at the end of the chapter, which allows a flat-footed non-horse rider to move after their action if they have any movement left. Pretty nice. If you're particularly quick, you can save a village for a bargain ring, which helps reduce prices. Eh, while you gagging about, we'll have you end up missing at least one of these. Not to say the game becomes impossible, but Nothing like getting some bonuses for putting in the early work, yeah. As Elliot with his army races toward Nodian to basically force the cases to accept him as her husband, Sigurd and his company head out to repel them. Other neighboring castles opt for different approaches. Clement of Macaulay Castle stays put, while Macbeth of Anthony sends bandits to plunder from the people. Mm, truthfully, Elliot and his cohorts really don't stand up too well against Sigurd and his forces. However, like I said before, the key for this chapter, especially the first half, is speed. Simply pushing forward may work, for there's beefy enough to deal with those units, but in trying to save the cases, earning the Night Ring, and getting that Bargain Ring, spoiler alert, I didn't get that one on this playthrough, do you have to advance thoughtfully, yet boldly, go forward? Sigurd and his troops blitz westward, conquer Herhein after dealing with Elliot, and consider what to do next. Elchon is still imprisoned and the bandits are making a mess of the place. Sigurd, eh, he decides to intervene and stop the Augustrian people's suffering. We pan over to King Chagall, who's enraged by Macbeth's greed, which he feels resulted in the loss of Herheim. This lights a fire under Macbeth to summon Volts and his mercenaries to stop Sigurd's advancing army. Two new units join, albeit indirectly, Sigurd's crusade. They are the powerful Windmage and 
Traveling Bard, Levin, and the Dancer, Sylvia. Neat aspect about dancing for those not quite in the loop, they're usually an incredibly fragile unit, uh, unless you do some uh, leveling up chicanery, but that's for another time. But they uh, can enliven the spirits, lift those spirits of the adjacent units to have another turn if they've already acted and moved, or just moved. Incredibly helpful and can truly pull you out of a bind if the moment is looking dicey. Two other units are also available this chapter, uh, but they need some work or setup to recruit. One is quite obvious. He is Beowulf, a mercenary riding with Volt's group. Now, there is a brief interaction with Beowulf and Volt's talking about the fickle nature of being a mercenary. Outside of the bit about money, the conversation really doesn't clue us in on who could be the one to recruit him, which is fine. Uh, you're able to use those save slots to go turns into a chapter to soften the blow of failure if it's not working out for you. But uh, mulling it over, you ought to be able to have the right idea and figure out that the one carrying a heavy purse is a mercenary's best friend, uh, or next target, but in this case, it's thankfully the former. Get anyone with 10,000 gold or more to talk with him, hand it over, and you've now added another pony unit to the army. As that happens, Sigurd, with his army, dispatches Volt's crew and decides a little workout in the arena is due. The arena is available in castle towns for each unit to test their metal. It's an easy way to gain experience in gold, but also an easy way to lose your life is what I would say, but genealogy is, if anything, benevolent. If you enter the fight from inside the castle and go to the arena from there, the character won't die if they're reduced to zero HP. They'll just be set back out there, not out in the battlefield, but just, uh, you know, they'll be set out there with just one HP, which that's quite merciful. That's, that's really nice. They can also back out, change their equipment, and go back in. Drawbacks would include only having seven fights for a unit per chapter being available. Uh, melee and ranged units have a couple different fighters to battle. Uh, but it's not really that much of a drawback. Anyways, this is important to say because a melee unit must run through those fights for this other unit. If you have a melee unit go through all those fights, the last fight in this chapter in the arenas is the sword fighter Holland. Or Holland. Uh, or wait, Chulane? <laughs> Pause, time out, hold it. Dun -dun -dun. I loathe translations of names for proper nouns in Fire Emblem and JRPGs of your... I mean, this still happens to this day, but I mostly stick to the older stuff, so I, you know, I ain't got time just to play everything, you know? Anyways, names get screwy and can be wildly different, like Hull into Tulane, or how about for a character soon to come up during this chapter? Fury, she gets called, uh, the... Erin? Erinis? Erinis? Uh... I mean, I get it. It's a neat little wink and nod, but... <laughs> or how about Deodora? <laughs> or they call her Deirdre. Elchon? Eldigan? Grandbell? Or how about Granvale? <laughs> that one is pretty close on being petty, but it's infuriating. It's not every name and place and all the important stuff, but shucks, howdy. It can be like talking two different languages. Sort of similar, though. Like speaking French to somebody who speaks Spanish. It's doable, but... Eh, there may be some stumbling blocks. Uh, maybe the French and Italian might be a little bit better. Anyways, it's it's not the most heinous thing, but it irks me to no end. Well, back to Holland. Beat him. He's not too difficult for Sigurd's might. I mean, Sigurd's getting pretty good right now. That's always nice. Afterward, he'll join, explaining that he sought out money as what drove him. In losing, he wants to turn over a new leaf and fight for a greater cause. Upon conquering Anthony and booting Macbeth, troubling news comes from home. Sigurd is informed by Lord Philet from Valhalla about rumors in the east. The royal court is rumbling that Sigurd, Quan, and Elchon are uniting to overthrow King Asmer, which is why Sigurd has kept the Prince of Isaac in his custody. This rumor seems to have been spread by Sigurd's father's enemies, Leptor and Langebolt, because they dislike how Prince Kurth has confided so much in Sigurd's father, Lord Byron. This news bleeds into details of a somewhat sordid affair. The married Duchess of Veltholmer, Sigun, and Prince Kurth once had an affair. This caused the Duke of Veltholmer to denounce the both of them and, uh, put himself to peace eternally, we'll say. The Duchess vanished 
leaving a very young Lord Arvis to grow up without his parents and to take care of his half-sibling, Azel. On the whispered words of this royal gossip, the player will have learned enough details to determine who the two children are, the two Archbishop Monfort is trying to bring together. Along with this information, we pan back over to Chagall, who is lying to the visiting Pegasus Knight Fury, who is searching for her prince, Levin, the guy who's going around acting like a traveling bard. Uh, Chagall's lie is that Levin has been captured and imprisoned in Evan's castle. So while Sigurd's forces rush to the northeast, Levin kind of sits around back at Evan's castle to eventually recruit Fury, the last new unit for the chapter, and Sigurd and company take Malachi. In doing so, Shadal freaks out, sends out Zine, the last of his troops, and he's tries to be comforted by the Archbishop Manfroy. And they have a brief back and forth. Manfroy suggests using Elchon to blunt the advancing edge of Sigurd's forces, and uh, yeah, Chagall's just uh, really not that too thrilled with him. But once that king leaves Manfroy alone, we bear witness to the Archbishop learning that Prince Kurth has been assassinated. He also reveals that Arvis carries the blood of Lopotosu. They only need to find Sigurd's daughter to begin the resurrection process of their Dark Lord. After breaking through the last of Chagall's forces and gravely wounding him, we learn the king was saved by Elchon himself. An intense standoff unfolds between between him and Sigurd. Elchon will do whatever he must to protect his king despite his failings, demanding to know why Granbel was occupying Augustria. Sigurd promises that his army is only there to stabilize the region, saying he'll be gone in a year. Elchon leaves, threatening to put Sigurd in the dirt if the vow is broken. And this closes out the chapter, and we soon find ourselves in chapter 3, opening up with more trouble brewing in Augustria. However, before we dig into this chapter, I want to express my appreciation quickly for the music in this game. There are a lot of great pieces peppered throughout this OST. Chapter 2's and 3's overworld themes are a couple of my favorite in the game. Heck, they're high up on my list of just favorites in the series and just game music in general. I like are the fighting and supporting dancer tunes. Those are nice and little catchy bops, as you will. themes are enjoyable, and the various army and palace themes color the different peoples of the continent well, mostly. The Thrakian ones have always struck me as a bit off. I like the songs, but they almost come off like comical villains, goofballs, the silly billies of the game, as it were. <laughs>
regardless, I'll be pointing out some other fantastic pieces when we get to the appropriate parts of the game, but for now, back to chapter 3. Time marches forward. Sigurd tries to balance his promise to his friend with the direct orders from the officials back in Valhalla. However, their demands have become more and more tyrannical, choking the Augustrian people to the point of disdain for their invading rulers. Despite Sigurd's attempts and promises to leave after a year, uh, Chagall has spent half of the year more than simply sulking and treating his wounds in Medino Castle. He's been amassing his remaining Augustrian forces and has decided to send them out to retake Augusta Castle. Farther up north, pirates of Orga Hill are itching to plunder, especially with so much fighting about to erupt in the south. However, Brigid has been keeping them at bay. As their leader, she has been keen to act more like the noble thief by giving help and aiding the poor. While nice to have that as a mission statement, anyone who has worked retail, or honestly really any job for that matter, what happens when the workers don't believe in the core of your beliefs for your company? Your group? Well, Bridget will soon find out. As Chagall's troops go on the attack, Elchon stands pat, not wanting to fight his friends since, honestly, the truth is that uh, the year has not passed. And Sigurd has tried to keep his word. However, uh, seeing this advancement, Sigurd rallies his own units for battle, making his wife anxious. She worries for his safety, as well as the safety of their young baby, Celeste. Or, <laughs> Celeth. <sighs> Sigurd vows everything will be alright, and entrusts the Prince of Isaac, Shannon, to protect them. Now, we're confronted with another step up in difficulty. Where battles have been fairly linear, if branching in directions, the beginning of this chapter has Sigurd and company dealing with advancing forces from three different directions. It may not seem like much, but with more movement being afforded to allies and enemies alike in this game, there are not as many places to cheese battles by plopping a heavy defensive unit at a choke point. Actually, I love it. This playthrough, I pushed a little too far out and had to collapse the line and regroup to keep Augusti from falling. Anyway, once Medino is captured and the attacks are repelled, all hell breaks loose. Father Claude of Ada and Tiltiu of Frige Another one of those that the name is a bit a awkward to begin with, but also just different in English. It's like tight. I don't know how do you say it? Tight. Hmm, tile to you. Similar, but still different. She's the daughter of Leptor, who is one of Sigurd's father's political enemies. These two appear and have some dreadful news from back home. The father informs Sigurd of Prince Kurth's murder. To make matters worse, Lord Byron has disappeared and is being accused of the deed. Claude tries to soothe Sigurd's concerns by revealing his plan to go to Blaggy Tower, which is on this map, to pray and be given answers through the Divine for what truly happened because of Father Claude's bloodline. Tiltiu doesn't care so much, she simply wants to go and be with Claude. Her father's attitude and behavior really doesn't deter her involvement, but there'll be more to talk about with her later. After they leave, we pan to Diodora, who wishes to see her husband, and tell Shannon to watch Celeste. While the game is mostly good about interactions, the true placement this time sort of makes the next event look like it unfolds directly in front of the others, and they don't do anything about it. <laughs> Oops. Anyway, she is confronted by Manfroy, who reveals he knows she is the daughter of Sagoon, the last piece needed to begin the resurrection of the Dark Lord. Manfroy uses his magic to subdue her and wipe her of her memories. Then they vanish. One more event unfolds as Chagall appears in the west in Silvel Castle with the last of Augustria's might. Infuriated by Elchon's hesitation, the king accuses him of wishing to overthrow him. Elchon denies this and takes his cross knights out to prove Augustrian's mettle. Uh, on the battlefield, once close enough to Sigurd, the two will exchange words. However, it will do nothing. The fight is on. The player can opt to meet the fight head on or send out Lachesis to try to talk some sense into her brother.
In going that route, she'll dress him down, saying if he knows all about honor, trust, and the such, being this great knight, this great man, then why is he willing to give his life to such a slug of a man in the form of Chagall? And she convinces him to try to reason with the king again. He'll give her the earth sword and darts back to Silvel Castle. However, there is no triumphant understanding, there is no cooling of the king's ire, there is no lowering of the weapons. Chagall will no longer suffer Elchon's insubordination. He orders his guards to restrain him and behead him then and there. And so it is done. The following turn, Sigurd mourns the loss of his friend, but the fighting must go on. Joining the fray, Trebant, the king of Thrakia, allows some of his troops of dragon knights to have some fun fighting. Sure, why not? They do not last long, and Trebant just bounces, wishing Shigal all the luck. Once the Vale Castle falls to Sigurd, he learns of his wife's disappearance, though Celeste is safe. Though Augustria has fallen, the pirates up north break out and pursue Brigid to kill her. Father Claude learns of the truth and receives the Valkyrie staff. I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> yeah, it's a Valkyrie staff. He begins to explain how revivification is possible for some, while not for others. Like for Tiltiu's sweet grandmother. He begins to talk about the life force, Aegir, but Tiltiu uh, doesn't care, especially with the place swarming with pirates. Ethlyn gives her husband the Gaybolg, which she worries about uh, the potential sorrow and its alleged history. Quan brushes off the concern as nothing more than legends and tales and promises they will soon return to their daughter Athena back in Leinster. Pressed for time, Sigurd and his troops must bolt up north to save Brigid, Father Claude, and Tiltiu. The pirates are dispatched fairly easily, and a few more pieces of information come to light. Brigid is actually the long-lost sister of Adian, whose capture kicked off Sigurd's inadvertent <laughs> war march, as reactive as a leader as he has been this whole time. Also, when Brigid and Adian reunite, Adian will give her sister their house's sacred bow, the Ichival, which cures Brigid of her forgotten past? It's a wee bit corny if you ask me, even if it reinforces the game's themes dealing with bloodlines and the such. Father Claude also informs Sigurd of what actually transpired. Evidently, many of the machinations were performed by Tiltiu's father, Leptor. He had King Mananen of Isaac murdered to prolong that land's unrest and continue the war with Granbel. But there's also some evil still veiled which Father Claude could not quite decipher. Sigurd believes it has to deal with the dark sect that he was told about, and also learns his father is still alive, but uh, he's not doing so well whatsoever. Upon conquering Orga Hill, Sigurd and Oife begin bringing the army together. However, Langabolt and Lepter appear in the south with Granbel's forces, labeling Sigurd as a traitor to the crown. Lamenting the deteriorating situation, Sigurd questions why. What was the point of all of this? The point of all this fighting and loss of life. In his despair, riders on winged horses appear from the east. At the behest of the Silesian's queen, Lana, they offer to take Sigurd and his army across the sea, placing them under the protective wings of Silesia, which he agrees to. And this is where will allow the curtains to fall once more, until we're ready to pull them back once more to delve into chapters 4 and 5. Thank you for watching, have a good day.